good to be back in the church after a week of break and I want to thank everyone for praying for me and for the meetings. I'll uh, update you on that later at the end of the service today. It's good to know that all of you are well and good <coughs> and my prayers were with you while I was away as well. We are moving on in the Gospel of John and today we have a big passage but my sermon will be focusing on just one word which is very central to the book of John. We will read John's Gospel chapter 8 verses 31 to 38. The truth will set you free. So Jesus so Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Chapter 5 to 10 is those six chapters we find the conflict between Jews, Jesus, and the various sections of Jews. So, in all, in these six chapters, we see people conflicting with Jesus and the debates and all that. Here we are picking up one debate or one conflict that he had. That conflict is with believing Jews. That is, a section of the Jews who had come to believe in Jesus Christ. But Jesus tells them that if you if you abide in my word and if you are truly my disciples, you are truly my disciples. And you will know the truth and the truth shall set you free. And if you read to the end of that passage which is up to verse 59, we see that there is an argument. These are people who believe in Jesus Christ. They know that Jesus is Messiah, they believe everything that Jesus says, but Jesus says that you are not yet my disciples. That happens only if you abide in my word, or my word abides in you. And then Jesus goes on talking about being the, the father God of God, and being slaves to sin, and it moves on like that. But the argument reaches a climax such that in verse 59, that is the end of the passage, these same Jews who believed in Jesus until now takes stones to throw him, to throw at him, to stone him. 8.59, that's how it all ends. Here is an argument. This is the, this, you just need to follow the story. It is Jews who believe in Jesus Christ. They have been following him everywhere. And Jesus says, if unless my word abides in you, you will not be my disciples. And if you know the truth, the truth shall set you free. But they were willing to believe in him, but not all that he says. And then the argument about what is sin, what is slavery, what is fatherhood of God, what is the fatherhood of Abraham, and the end of it, comes to a stage where they take stones to stone him to death. Now we'll come back to the story later. But what I would like to focus on is this issue of abiding. Abiding. This is a issue, this is a concept, this is a theme that we find in the John's Gospel. It's a very, very central theme. In 656, we have already met that. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. We just had the table of the Lord. What do we do? We actually accept the, in, by faith that these are symbols of the Lord's body that is broken for us and the blood that is shed for us. And whoever accepts that, they abide in Jesus. Blood abides in 
me and I in him. Now, there is, when we come to chapter 15, that is part of the farewell speech, we see this theme word again and again and again. Many times, more than half a dozen times, Jesus talks about abiding in me, abiding in Christ, abiding in the word. So this is a very, very central theme. What is it? To abide is a simple word. But it is loaded with a lot of truth, biblical truth. It's a very simple word. It simply means to stay in one place. It can simply mean keep something. Abide means to keep something, something intransitively. If it means something abides with me, that means I am dwelling on it. Probably that's a very naive meaning. But it also may means something that is part of me or I'm holding on or something that I will cling on to. That is what abiding is. But as I said, there is a lot of truth more than the simple word meaning. And we see this idea throughout the scripture. Abiding is a promise of God. In Ezekiel chapter 37, 27 to 28, abiding is a promise of God. You now you know the story of Ezekiel 37. Ezekiel is sent to the valley of bones where there is disparate bones, skeletons scattered all over. And he pro prophesies to these bones and the bones come, come together and they get skin and flesh and sinews and they become a huge army. And that is basically symbolic of the revival of the scattered Jews. The Jews will come back to God again and they will become a nation again and they will be an army for God. But at the end of that passage, God says his promise and that is Ezekiel 37, 27 to 28 where he says, My dwelling place shall be with them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord who sanctifies Israel when my sanctuary is in their midst forever. That is the promise of God that there comes a day when he will dwell among his people or abide with his people. Same thing you can see in Exodus 29, 45. I will dwell among the people of Israel and I will be their God. God wants to dwell with his people. And then we see that is a desire of God. It's a promise of God. And God is God's desire. God's desire is that to dwell among his people. Leviticus 26 verse 11 says, I will make my dwelling among you and my soul shall not abhor you and I will walk among you and will be your God and you shall be my people. I will dwell among you. And then you can say, see the same thing in Exodus 25, 8. And this is the beauty of Christian faith. The beauty of the Christian faith is that God longs to live with his people. It is very different from other religious faiths. They go to where God is. But here, the, the biblical faith says God comes seeking to people, seeking God's people, people so that he can dwell among them. Now, in a sense, <coughs> this unique faith, this unique faith has been, been fulfilled throughout the history. We see it is fulfilled partially, at least in the tabernacle. Hope you read your Bible if you are new in faith. Please read your Bible so that you know what I'm talking about. Not only me, anyone who preaches. And that we cannot, in 30 minutes or 35 minutes of sermon, we cannot preach the entire Bible. So please read, at least if you are new in faith, please read at least six chapters of the Bible a day so that you are familiar with what, what it is all about. If you never been to Sunday school, I had the privilege of going to a Sunday school. Now, when God told Moses to build a tabernacle in Exodus. You know, that was fulfilled. That is, God 
dwelling among them was fulfilled. Now, once the Exodus chapter 40 verses 34 to 38 go the then the cloud covered the tent of the meeting and then we read that this tent was carried over carried on on their journey so God dwelt came and dwelt in the, uh, the three tabernacle so that they could carry it on and on and wherever they went so it was a sort of partial fulfillment that is it was fulfilled in part and then it was a temporary fulfillment in John's Gospel chapter 114 I have preached about on this so if you have been regular in the church you know what I was talk, what I'm talking about and it says and the word became flesh and though it says dwelt among us in the translation there the, the original Greek translation is and made a tabernacle or tabernacled among us and as is talking this is talking about Jesus's incarnation and we think that we believe that for 33 and a half years Jesus came in human form and that human form was a tabernacle of God the presence of God for 33 and a half years that Jesus came to and the Emmanuel or God is with us and that was only for 33 and a half years but God was in human flesh with us but now what about after that that is why we should be studying the gospel of John chapter 15 which we'll do God willing later and in the 15 the chapter 4th fourth, fourth verse says now even now there is an ongoing spiritual relationship abiding that is going on even after his Christ's death and resurrection we are still continuing or that experience of God dwelling among his people is still on that is why he says in 15.4 abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in me neither can you unless you abide in me now what ha what's going on is that we are the dwelling uh, dwelling the dwelling of or the uh, of god god continues to christ continues to dwell among us now we need to know that uh, this command comes in the farewell speeches that is uh, from 13th chapter onwards is Jesus bidding farewell and is leaving the instructions to his disciples he says I'm going to my father and uh, when I'm gone I will uh, also take you to my father's house where I have uh, in my father's manor house there are many rooms and I'm preparing room for you and all that so when he's bidding farewell he say I'm going he says abide in me that is Though I'll be physically gone, though this temple, that my, that's my body, Jesus' body, will be destroyed and it will be, it will be raised back, still, while I am bodily away from you, while I am physically away from you, we still continue the relationship. That is the experience that I and you ought to have right now. And that's a spiritual experience. It's an ongoing experience, but it is not a complete experience. But there comes a day when the book of jo uh, Revelation talks about the new heaven and the new earth. In the place of this polluted, corrupt earth and these uh, uh, heavens, there will be a new heaven and new earth that Jesus is coming. And that will be the climax of this experience of abiding. Revelation chapter 21 verse 3 says and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying behold the dwelling place of God is with man he will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God we are now going back to Exodus now when God wanted to dwell among his people he had a tabernacle now comes a day in full, the fulfillment of that, when a new heaven and new earth will be there and God will descend and will live with his people 
in the new heaven and in the new earth. Now we are between this. That is, Christ Jesus offered or commanded that abide in me. And he promised that he will abide with us. Here is a promise and a command. Now, the many things that we need to talk about this, until we wait for the fulfillment of that, we need to know that this is a reciprocal idea, that is experience. In John's Gospel 15, 6, 15, 4, it says, Abide in me, and I in you. What is this dwelling place experience mean? What is this abiding experience mean? It is not just one way, it's a two way. It is a reciprocal experience. You, disciples, you abide in me. And that means I abide in you. That is reciprocal. That is, God, we abide in him and he will abide in us. It is like two circles, overlapping circles. There are two entities, that is, these are the two circles. But these are not separate. Yes, they were separate. Before our salvation, before our redemption, the human race and God, they were separate. And then they come together closer and closer so that they can overlap now. That is, Christ abides in us and we abide in him. Salvation is not, salvation could be a bridge. That is, God and man connected. But Christian experience is that the bridge disappears, but the two entities, spiritual entities, by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, we come together and become one, though distinct. That is, God, Christ, though He is not physically with us now, He is spiritually with us now. And that is what we call the abiding in Jesus Christ. And I want to say, that's a very unique experience. As I said, let me also try to repeat what I said. This is the uniqueness and the beauty of Christian faith. You are not going to a local place, a localized God, a God who is limited in a particular shrine in a particular place. But you, God, comes seeking fellowship with us. What is fellowship? Fellowship is having something in common. Something in common. I have something in common with you. You have something in common with me. And that's possible because of this abiding. It's a, it's a mutual, reciprocal experience. Why should we abide in Him? If you understand what I said so far, or what I was trying to uh, explain so far, that is, here, I'll put it simply one more time. Let me attempt that. Here is a possibility of the human beings experiencing God the divine through Jesus Christ. And that's possible by when he abides in us and we abide in him. And now, that experience is, what is the purpose of that? The purpose is very, very clear. 15.4 It says, Abide in me, and I abide in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it abides in wine, neither can you, unless you abide in me. The whole purpose of this is to be fruitful. You have, you see, it's, if you read Psalm 1, it's very clear in Psalm 1. What's the purpose of human life? Human life has to be fruitful. It's not barrenness. It's not talking about biological or fertility. Biological fru fruitfulness. Now, what, at the end of the day, how will you judge your life or others will judge your life? Is your life a fruitful life or a fruitless life? 
I'm not talking about physical fruits. See, that's metaphorically, you know what I'm talking about. You know, will this life be a life that blessed people? A life which benefited people? A life which left its own print on the sands of history? Or the memory of the people? It's not just talking about that. When you pass from this life, the impact you made in the lives of others, will it stay or not? Or will you ever make an impact on the people? That is why I said, will you leave the footprints, your footprints on the sands of history or sands of the memory of the community that where you lived? Or will you just disappear, vaporize into thin air? One aspect of being fruitful. In order to be fruitful, we have to abide in Him. Fruitfulness or fruit bearing is the primary purpose of God. If you divide the whole world, you see the physical, the phenomena, phenomenal world into three kingdoms. You know, we I mean those who've been studied um, science, at least the fourth standard or the fifth standard, may know this. I don't have to explain it. Now we have the plant kingdom, we have the animal kingdom, and we have the mineral kingdom. Plant kingdom is all those are the the uh, plant kingdom are the trees and all sort of uh, thing. And science divides them into two, to what is that, biology, the zoology and the rest of it, you know, the life. Animals, okay, the animal kingdom, and there is mineral kingdom. But God in Gen Genesis 1.12 commanded or designed the plant kingdom in such a way that in Genesis 1.12, the earth brought forth vegetation that is according to God's plan. Uh, plants yielding seed according to their own kinds and trees bearing fruit in which there is their seed each according to its kind. It's a very simple science, scientific truth. You can argue about it. You can say you can grow another plant from its cutting. Now there is budding, there is grafting and there are a lot. You also have see, uh, uh, what do you call fruit without seed and uh, all sort of things and um, yes um, what I'm trying to say is that the plants has to reproduce themselves that was God's plan self propagating and that is why in the animal kingdom God designed the animals in such a way that they will produce their own kind and specifically to man, man God said Adam and Eve and God blessed them in Genesis 1.22, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let birds multiply. Now, the primary purpose of being is to bear fruit. <clears throat> the primary purpose of being is to bear fruit. Now, I can go on and on and on about the spiritual fruit and all that, but I am not going to talk about that. I am talking about the general principle. Every human life should be fruitful. Now, it is not just about fruitfulness in a human life. The spiritual life or the life of faith must be fruitful. Now, there are lots of, maybe you contrast, by contrast you may understand. And there are lots and lots of churches, lots of people who preach a type of gospel where it is basically for your own well-being. There are people who preach a gospel which is a sort of an aspirational theology. That is what you want to be that you can be. There are lots of people who preach a gospel of sort of a so spirituality which detaches them from the world. But the spirituality I see, Christian faith I see in the Bible is a life that is lived for the sake of others, as Christ did. Now, Nobi has been talking a lot about yesterday. I also heard today. Also, I heard this the, the, the word costly grace. The reason why he is primed with this, uh, maybe many of us are primed, our thoughts are primed with this expression costly grace is because 
That's a book we are reading now, Costly Discipleship. The cost of discipleship. Where Bonhoeffer talks about the costly grace. What is costly grace? Costly grace, first of all, recognizes that the grace we received by from God is not free nor cheap. It is free but not cheap. It's a costly grace. It's a grace that costs uh, the Father God the life of his son. Now, since it is a costly grace, it has to be lived out recognizing the co its costliness to meet all the costs. It, it will demand, it's, it, it has a high demand, cost demand. Sometimes in the born of his life, it demanded his life. So on the way, it produces fruit, spiritual fruit for the sake of God. Now that's what we are talking about. Abiding leads to, without abiding, no fruit is possible. You have to abide in Christ, abide in the wine. One of the things I did with the two, two days break I had at home, in my little farm was to go around with a cutter and go around and cut the trees that I do, the branches I don't want. I am trying to grow some teak wood and it is branching out unnecessarily. Every unnecessary branch will weaken the trunk. So I had to go around and cut all the offshoots so that the main trunk will grow strong and fast. Cut it off. And what happens is a cut, the cut pieces. The cut pieces, the next time I visit, will be dry and will be burnt. Now I just left it because it's difficult to burn them right now. I let it, let, it, let it dry up and I will burn during the next visit. Cut off. I am pretty sure that the branches that I have cut off are not going to bear fruit at all. They are cut off from the tree. Now, unless we have a, a very deeper relationship with Jesus Christ, we cannot be fruit bearers at all. Now, how do we, if that is the purpose of abiding in Christ, how does it happen? How does it really, really happen? It's very much, very clear. Is there is no, no, you don't have to break your head over this. In John's Gospel 8.31, the passage that we read, it says, so Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, they have believed in him. That means they know he is the Messiah or something else. If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. Jesus says, you have to move a step further from being my believers, believing in him. But if the, my word abides in you, please note that you will be my disciples. That's exactly what he said in 15th chapter verse 7 where he says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, if you abide in me and my words abide in you. Now 15.4, he actually paraphrases it here. He says, if I, you abide in me, I abide in you. But now when we come three verses up, uh, uh, down, it says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, what does that mean? That Jesus abiding in us is by means of his words abiding in us. It's a very difficult concept, I know. I don't think I have fully understood it as well. Now when we say Christ abides in us, that simply means the words of Christ abides in us. Now, take this case of this believing Jews, chapter 8, verse 31 to 59. This passage, Jesus is, is helping us to understand what is believing and what is abiding. This passage helps us to understand the difference between believing in Jesus and abiding in Jesus or the word abiding in them. These Jew, Jews are different from the rest of the Jews. rest of the Jews could not believe in Jesus Christ. You know, if you read the, the earlier chapters, 
they doubted him but here is another group of people from the same jews and they are willing they are believers in jesus but jesus tells this uh, jew uh, believing jews so if you only if you have my words abide in you you will be my disciples and now then jesus says now he talks about father and they talk about abraham their father then he talks about say, slaves to sin and they talk about slavery in the political or social sense and there is an argument they were not willing they are resisting the word of jesus they are resisting the word to dwell in them they are resisting if you you should have read the passage you know they are, they are resisting the word to transform their mental framework they are resisting they are not able to change their faith their tradition their traditional dogmas because they still keep on saying abraham is our father when jesus says you have a father father god and i will show you the father god they are not willing to move because they are resisting the abiding word what does that mean by believing in jesus is a cognitive change cognitive change means you change what you know or you are willing to accommodate new theories and new knowledge that is what cognitive change is that's all that is needed for believing in jesus to believe in jesus all that you need is to accommodate the knowledge of jesus into your head accommodate it cognitively that's what happens abiding is another experience abiding is when we allow what jesus tells us and teaches us to change our own mental framework the way we think the value system that we hold on to the dogmas that we cling on to only when what jesus says transforms that part abiding happens christian spirituality is not a cognitive change cognitive change means change of what i know it is also a change of why i know what i know why i have come to believe what it is so what happens here is because they were not willing to change that concept the the reason for their belief they don't have a rational for their belief they are not willing to change transform themselves that means their mental greed their world view their notions they were not allowing their notions to be challenged by that they could not abide in him because of this it comes to a climax in the 59th verse that the same jews who believed in him who could not become his disciples they took stones to throw at him it ends with that opposition now i'm trying to explain what this abiding means i have i hope i have tried my level best and i'm pretty sure the holy spirit will continue to convince you as well it's not is beyond that intellectual ascent now finally we have to explore it further what is the evidence of this john says in his epistle to sec, um, second chapter of this epistle first john 2:6 he says who are says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked what is the evidence the evidence of abiding in him is not a mystical experience yesterday i realized that i met a couple yesterday that in the same building on the sixth floor there is hari rama hari krishna movement as well when they were going for a meeting counselors meeting maybe you call it elders meeting in the same building we preach gospel here but up there on the sixth floor on the southern south tower there is a hari krishna movement now they have a different theology they have a different belief system but we believe but we can be another hari krishna we can be another buddhist zen buddhist meditation group is a meeting regularly in pune city i get invitations to that 
But what's the difference? The difference is that we commit ourselves to Christ's demand that we allow Christ to transform us by his own word. Now, those who say they abide in him, they, he abides in him, ought to walk the same way in which he walked. That's an amazing challenge. A great challenge. A challenge that really, really makes me threaten itself as well. Can I really be like Christ? Now what it says is that abiding in me is evident in the life that it produces. It produces life or it transforms a carnal life in such a way that the life is a word-shaped life. We are all victims or we, let me use a, a milder word. We are all products of our own convictions. We are all products of our own notions. Sometimes notions produced by the traditions like these disciples. But these same wrong notions has, can be changed. That is why uh, the word of God says you are sanctified by the word that you heard. It sanctifies us. Now the same thing can transform us, make us more Christless as well. It can, the word can shape. It has that power to shape. It is not changing your doctrine, not becoming a Pentecostal, a Catholic becoming Pentecostal. No, I'm not talking about it. A Hindu becoming a believing Christian. No, that's not about that. Or a Muslim beginning getting baptized and joining the church. Yes, but that's only belief. That's only beginning of a belief system. But on the way, until we reach eternity, here is the word of God transforming us, challenging us. Let me conclude. They ought to walk, ought to live as Christ. What happens is, when the word of God becomes part of our thinking, and it ch challenges our attitudes and it transforms our way, the way of behaving or behavioral changes. We become more and more like Christ. That I was taught when I was a young believer was this. When you are confronted with any challenges in life, ask a simple question, WWJD, what would Jesus do? That will answer the question. That will, that will solve the problem. If in this particular situation, when I, it is me who has to make a choice, if it is when I have to make a choice, now the simple question is WWJD. What would Jesus do in that particular situation if I am right now? Will Jesus make that choice? Will Jesus say what I am about to say? No, aligning my thoughts, my behavior and my attitudes with Christ's mind, Christ's attitude and Christ's behavior is the abiding in Jesus Christ. Let me tell you this, it's the most difficult thing. Nobody can preach from this pulpit saying, look at me, I am doing it. No, this is a sacred goal that we are striving towards to. What would Jesus do? When we have challenges, when we have, sometimes we have to show compassion to people who do not deserve compassion. Ordinarily, in human thinking, they don't deserve our compassion. The question now is, what would Jesus do? There are times when we try to accommodate, which we should not be accommodating. Then the question is, what would Jesus do? Will he accommodate what I am trying to accommodate? There are times when we will have to reconcile with people, sometimes give up, sometimes oppose. A lot of things we have to do, choices in life. But abiding in Christ is to answer this question, would Jesus do this? 
that's but how do we decide that is when his words as i said the two semi circles they overlap and then that abiding the word that abides in us because of jesus his word that is why our minds should be saturated in such a way in such a way our minds should be enriched by the word of god in such a way our life should be saturated by the indwelling holy spirit who leads us into all the truths so that we will begin to bear fruits you can bear fruits but not all fruits are good that is why god with the word of god says bearing good fruit sometimes people produce fruit there are outcomes in their life but absolutely detestable and destructive fruits that doesn't come from god that comes from the evil one you need to know that i also sometimes we produce as well fruits when when it comes to uh, which are not good as well now i had a few i have a few things when it comes to compassion feeling for others empathy courage to face difficult situation the resolves that we need to take the patience we need to show the love that we should love with you can go on with that list will that this abiding of christ through his word and his spirit guide us and transform our lives praise be to god